this the next poem is a uh, a parody of a poem by William Carlos of Williams, which I love. But I saw in some of <coughs> Williams's poems something which, if carried a little further, could become insanity. In that, in his poetry, desire always wins, no matter what. I mean, he it, it always wins if he's supposed to be going to a patient's house and he wants to stop to look at a tree, he stops and that's terrific because it feels good and saves the patient. Anyway. The poem this is a variation on is um, this poem. This is just to say, I've eaten the plums that were in the icebox and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious, so sweet, so cold. I saw something in my own personality which could drive this over the edge, so I wrote these variations on a theme by William Carlos Williams. One, I chopped down the house that you had been saving to live in next summer. I am sorry, but it was morning. And I had nothing to do. And its wooden beams were so inviting. Two, we laughed at the hollyhocks together, and then I sprayed them with lye. <laughs> Forgive me, I simply do not know what I am doing. I gave away the money that you had been saving to live on for the next ten years. <laughs> the man who asked for it was shabby, and the firm March wind on the porch was so juicy and cold. Four. Last evening we went dancing, and I broke your leg. <laughs> Forgive me, I was clumsy, and I wanted you here in the wards where I am the doctor. <laughs> this is the last thing I read. It's called The Circus. It's about writing a poem I wrote 14 years ago. I was thinking about what it was like when I wrote that poem, and all I thought about it. All the people in here are real. Actually, this building is mentioned in, in, in the third line when it used to be the Whitney Museum <laughs> of the circus I remember when I wrote the circus I was living in Paris or rather we were living in Paris Janice Frank was alive the Whitney Museum was still on 8th Street or was it still something else Fernand Leger lived in our building well it wasn't really our building it was the building that we lived in next to a Grand Guignol troupe who made a lot of noise so that one day I yelled through a hole in the wall of our apartment, I don't know why there was a hole there, shut up! And the voice came back to me saying something, I don't know what. Once I saw Leger walk out of the building, I think. Stanley Kunitz came to dinner. I wrote The Circus in two tries, the first getting most of the first stanza. That fall I also wrote an opera libretto called Louisa or Matilda. Jean-Claude came to dinner. He said about cocktail sauce, it should be good on something, but not on these oysters. By that time, I think I had already written The Circus. Part of the inspiration came while walking to the post office one night, evening, and I wrote a big segment of The Circus when I came back, having been annoyed to have to go. I forget what I went there about. You were back in the apartment. What a dump. Actually, we liked it, I think, with your hair and your writing and the pans moving strummingly about the kitchen, and I wrote The Circus. It was a summer night. No, it was an autumn one. Summer when I remember it, but actually no autumn that black dusk toward the post office. And I wrote many other poems then, but the circus was the best. Maybe not by far the best. Geography was also wonderful. And the airplane Betty poems inspired by you. But the circus was the best. Sometimes I feel I actually am the person who did this, who wrote that, including that poem, The Circus. But sometimes, on the other hand, I don't. There are so many factors engaging our attention. At every moment, the happiness of others, the health of those we know and our own, and the millions upon millions of people we don't know and their well-being to think about. So it seems strange I found time to write the circus and even spent two evenings on it, and that I have also the time to remember that I did it and remember you and me then and write this poem about it. At the beginning of the circus, the circus girls are rushing through the night in the circus wagons, and tulips and other flowers will be picked a long time from now. This poem wants to get off on its own someplace like a painting, not held to a depiction of composing the circus. Noel Lee was in Paris then, but usually out of it, in Germany or Denmark, giving a concert as part of an endless activity, which was either his career or his happiness, or a combination of both, or neither. 
I remember his dark eyes looking. He was nervous with me, perhaps, because of our days at Harvard. It is understandable enough to be nervous with anybody. How softly and easily one feels when alone, love of one's friends, when one is commanding the time and space syndrome, if that's the right word, which I doubt. But together, how come one is so nervous? One is not always, but what was I then and what am I now attempting to create, if create is the right word, out of this combination of experience and aloneness? And who are you telling me it is or is not a poem, not you? Go back with me, though, to those nights I was writing The Circus. Do you like that poem? Have you read it? It is in my book, Thank You, which Grove just reprinted. I wonder how long I'm going to live and what the rest will be like. I mean, the rest of my life. John Cage said to me the other night, how old are you? And I told him, 46. Since then, I've become 47. He said, oh, that's a great age, I remember. John Cage once told me he didn't charge much for his mushroom identification course at the new school because he didn't want to make a profit from nature. He was ahead of his time. I was behind my time. We were both in time. Brilliant. Go to the head of the class. And time is a river. It doesn't seem like a river to me. It seems like an unformed plan. Days go by and still nothing is decided about what to do until you know it never will be. And then you say time. But you really don't care much about it anymore. Time means something when you have the major part of yours ahead of you, as I did in Aix-en-Provence. That was three years before I wrote The Circus. That year I wrote Bricks and the Great Atlantic Rainway. I felt time surround me like a blanket, endless and soft. I could go to sleep endlessly and wake up and still be in it. But I treasured secretly the part of me that was individually changing. Like Noah Lee, I was interested in my career. And still am. But now it's like a town I don't want to leave. Not a tower I'm climbing opposed by ferocious enemies. I never mentioned my friends in my poems at the time I wrote The Circus although they meant almost more than anything to me. Of this now, for some time, I felt an attenuation, so I'm mentioning them. Maybe this will bring them back to me, not them, perhaps, but what I felt about them. John Ashbery, Jane Freilicher, Larry Rivers, Frank O'Hara. Their names alone bring tears to my eyes, as seeing Polly did last night. It is beautiful at any time, but the paradox is leaving it in order to feel it. When you've come back, the sun has declined and the people are merrier, or else they've gone home altogether, and you are left alone. Well, you put up with that. Your sureness is like the sun while you have it, but when you don't, it's lax a black and icy night. I came home and wrote the circus that night, Janice. I didn't come and speak to you and put my arm around you and ask you if you'd like to take a walk or go to the Cirque Medrano, though that's what I wrote poems about, and I am writing about that now, and now I'm alone. And this is not as good a poem as the circus, and I wonder if any good will come of either of them all the same. Thank you. If you feel like asking me things while I'm sitting here, that's sometimes more interesting than not saying anything or asking me questions while we're drinking. I don't know. What do you usually do? <laughs> I don't know if you're up to answering questions or if you want to. Okay. <laughs> they peter out. Do you know where that dreadful expression comes from? I can All right. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, I use a lot. I said I thought that they were probably dead except for long narrative poems in which I use them. Oh, no. I mean, the, uh, that poem is sort of like, I believe everything I said. I believe it all, yeah. Uh, Byron has a very funny passage in Don Juan about aesthetics, and he finally, he's sort of saying, uh, maybe, the, and he said, really what my aesthetic is, I'll tell you confidentially, is you will write what I damn well please. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, as soon as one makes a statement about art, right, saying that it's impossible to paint a miniature, doesn't that make everybody want to immediately try it? I mean, there's no statement that you can make about art which doesn't make somebody want to try the opposite. So. Peter is here already. Yes? Uh, I'm, I'm uh, not sure what 
in contemporary poetry would uh, identify <coughs> something as a poem, as opposed to a letter or a part of the diary. Are there any any uh, characteristics most left or anything that most something letters about? and parts of diaries aren't really much fun to read for the fifth time unless you know the person who wrote them. Uh, so poetry has to be good to be poetry? Well, <laughs> it's one of those things. It's like painting has to be good to be art, but in poetry you've only got one word. So um, one could argue about that in a rather arid way forever. I, It's really hard to define poetry. It's hard to define art. Um, it's sort of like the difference between male and female hippopotamuses. If you don't know what it is, it doesn't matter. I mean, they know. And when, when you get an aesthetic, <laughs> if you get an aesthetic, and modern artists and poets and composers are all extremely interested in this idea, and we all find a lot of inspiration in it, in precisely what is art and what isn't. I mean, it's a source of inspiration. And if you get an aesthetic response to something, if you get it to a letter, terrific. I, I don't mean so much in terms of uh, what something is worth, but rather just as a form. Like a painting, you used to be able to tell a painting from a piece of sculpture, or a poem from a novel, or something like that. Uh -huh. And today, I don't know, I mean, I'm not informed, really, I'm asking you to, well, are there still any water lines, or is it just whatever you call a poem will be a poem? Kind of along that line, like you've collaborated with several, you know, like artists and everything, so artists and uh -huh. painters and sculptors and books and everything. Uh, do you see anything like that now going on? Uh, I mean, any any collaboration between you know, like the different fine arts? You know? I still do it every once in a while. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I sort of am not as close to painters as I used to be. I think that's there was a time in the... Uh, so I don't know as much about what's going on, really. I feel a little, a little out of it. Uh, it certainly is true that, that financial success sort of ended a very exciting social period of, of painting in New York. When I remember in, in my days at the Cedar Bar, the, the poets were Frank O'Hara and John Ashbery and I, and uh, de Kooning was around and Franz Klein was around, and. Philip Gustin and lots of younger painters, and everybody was terribly excited, and we all felt we shared a big secret. We were all geniuses and more or less unknown, and it, it all seemed to go together and was very exciting. And collaborating then was not a commercial thing to do or anything. We were just all very excited about each other. Um, the people I collaborated with were Larry Rivers and uh, Alex Katz and Joe Brainerd. I don't know. I mean. You can answer the question better than I. You know, as I got as I got older and more published, more poems. As you get older, you don't really need your artistic friends as much. Like the, those friends are my whole life, uh, but uh, and my only audience also. Uh, that kind of association usually doesn't remain as intense, at least of a large group of people. There are quite a few of them usually doesn't remain as intense when you're 40 years old as it was when you're 25. Uh, what kind of younger poets are you interested in now? Are you interested in any younger poets in poetry magazines? Yeah, I like a lot of, I like a lot of poets, but I, I really am not going to tell you which ones I like because about half of them have been my students and wouldn't like it at all if I didn't like their work. Yeah. <laughs> Well, are poets and painters collaborating a lot now or not? Uh, I don't think so anymore. Like, you know, I've, I've seen you know, a couple of the books that were made. Painters were just terrific for us poets because for Frank and John and me, the poets who were around were so boring. They were all, as I said in one poem, thinking about the myth and the misses and the midterms. They're all these sort of boring academic people who worked in universities and I, they were very, they had this attitude that the great age of experiment and poetry was over with. Painters, like the abstract expressionist painters, if I may use the term, and we poets were very similar in the sense that the painters were much more like us than any novelists were or than the academic poets were because the painters had the idea, maybe I need a little green there. It's like, maybe you put another line there. It was, it was action. 
what we were doing. And it was catching, usually, except in long or large words, a single feeling. And uh, our work was really closer to their paintings than it was to academic poems with, full of symbols, and, or it's certainly closer to that than to novels or stories. The painters were terrific for us because not only did we inspire each other, and no matter what you read, you shouldn't think it was just the painters who inspired the poets, because uh, Frank O'Hara particularly sort of sustained with um, artistic plasma the lives of a great many um, painters. But uh, along with inspiring us, the painters also furnished a marvelous social life. They uh, worked hard in the daytime with their bodies, so they sort of they had a good conscience at night. They felt good. They had lofts, so they had parties. They drank a lot, and they were terrific. And the poets we knew were these measly little critters who had their great papers. Uh, so it was really great to know the painters. There was, of course, that famous false, tough, abstract expression as bon ami. I mean, uh, I had to tell Norman Bloom I would kill him the next time he slapped me on the back, and he finally stopped. I mean, there was there were some bad things about it, but um, <laughs> I never did plan that murder. 